Hello, this is Alicia from MobilityMastery.com, and this is our last video in the series, Fast Fascia Facts. So we're here at episode eight. This will conclude our eight week series, all about fascia and giving you some facts about fascia and then extrapolating from them what it could mean for your life and your body and your vitality. So this is our last one and these three, uh, no, you know, are definitely important and probably a little repetitive. At least this one is going to be, and I'm saving that for last for a reason. Uh, but number one here is actually, you know, new content. And I really hope you take something out of this and apply it to your own body as it pertains to any injuries you may uh, have experienced so far in life or been diagnosed with. So um, the way that these work, these videos is I'm going to run through the facts um, and then I'm going to share with you my theory about why it's important to know this information um, for your own personal use. So, uh, <clears throat> and then definitely wanna hear from you guys as well, anything that stands out. So number one, tendons and ligaments are fascia or connective tissue. And not a lot of people know that. I think it's something you should know about your own body. So you kind of have like a basic operator's manual for your body, right? Like you know how to actually think about your body and whenever you're injured, know how to address it. Um, and tendons and ligaments, of course, can be involved in a lot of injuries. So we have things like tendinosis um, or tendinitis. And then we have things like an ACL tear, um, right? A ligament tear in the knee. Uh, but tendons and ligaments are fascia. They're made of fascia. So I'm going to come back when I extrapolate and tell you more about this from a scientific perspective, but also my perspective, um, and then why this should matter to you and how you can use this information to optimize your body and live your best life and fully inhabit your body um, or heal from injuries faster. Uh, number two, this is probably one of my favorite facts about fascia, something that I'm still kind of like processing and unpacking for myself and also trying to get better at articulating for all of you and for my students and for my clients, because I think that this has huge implications. But the fact here, the science, is that fascia contains a multitude of and prioritizes responses to interoceptors and you have more interoceptors in your fascia than proprioceptors. So we've talked about proprioception and proprioceptors before, and the fact that you have 10 times as many proprioceptors in your fascia than muscle fiber. And just a little recap here, proprioceptors are your brain and body's way of assessing your posture and your alignment and your balance and where your physical body is in space, um, whatever space you're in. And then proprioceptors actually help you conduct movement given the space that your body has assessed that you're in. For example, it could just be standing on your kitchen floor making coffee, or it could actually be on a balance beam doing gymnastics uh, or climbing a tree, right? But all these things require your body to know what kind of terrain you're on so it can cue the appropriate physical response to keep you um, effective, safe, and you know, like optimized as far as like your movement goes. Um, and this isn't meant to be about proprioception. I just wanted you to know uh, that little bit because proprioception is hugely important, right? We've talked about how important it is, especially as we age due to how it impacts our balance, our ability to balance um, and get up and down off the floor. Uh, but the fact that you have more interoceptors in your fascia than proprioceptors to me is like hugely telling. And I'm gonna circle back around to this in a moment um, and give you my theory, of course, on this and why it should matter to you. But um, interoception is your ability to assess your internal landscape or terrain and then cue appropriate behavior given whatever you are assessing. And interoception is largely unconscious. So interoceptors are sensory receptors that receive information about your internal body. And then based on what is happening, what your interoceptors assess, um, may cue you to behave in certain ways. Um, for example, 
Interoception is the process by which your body and brain are assessing whether you're still breathing, whether your heart is doing what it's supposed to do to move blood through your body, right? Um, whether you're hungry, whether you're cold, whether you're hot, um, stuff like that. Uh, and then I'm gonna extrapolate on this because I think there are some implications here for um, how we each inhabit our body and what is going on internally at the not so physiological level because everything is connected. So I'm gonna come back to that in a moment because that's not part of the fact or the science, it's my extrapolation. Uh, and then number three is optimal fascia is gonna be up to 70% water just like the rest of our body, <laughs> go figure. Um, and this is hugely important for health as it pertains to everything that fascia impacts. And fascia, of course, as we've talked about so often in this series, has a direct relationship to muscle fiber and muscle gliding to your joints and joint lubrication and being able to move freely in your joints. Um, we're gonna talk about, of course, like its relationship to tendons and ligaments right now. Um, and then the nervous system and nerve receptors, because a lot of your nerves and um, nerve endings are actually coated in fascia. So there's a relationship there between um, your fascial system and the nervous system. And then we've, of course, talked about cellular uh, hydration and nutrition. Um, and a lot of that has to do with this water content. But um, I've saved it for last because it has so much to do with optimization um, in numerous ways, physiologically and otherwise, and I'm gonna extrapolate on that when we circle back around. All right, so tendons and ligaments, they are fascia. Uh, and most of you are probably more familiar with tendons than ligaments because you're gonna get something like Achilles tendonitis or elbow tendonitis or uh, tendonitis on the tops of your feet, for example. So a lot of us are familiar with tendonitis and maybe a little less familiar with tendinosis. Uh, and the difference between those is somewhat important, though not the purpose of this fast fascia fact. So I definitely encourage you to learn more about your tendons and ligaments. If this interests you, you could take it to Google um, and learn some stuff pretty quickly, even on the, you know, the first page or Wikipedia or whatever you happen to land on. Um, but tendons uh, connect muscle to bone and ligaments connect bone to bone. Um, so ligaments, you know, go from, they, they form from and attach to bones, whereas tendons form from within the musculature and then come out of that and attach to a bony junction. Uh, so that's the main difference between tendons and ligaments. Ligaments, by their nature, tend to be more fibrous and dense um, than tendons, I think, but they're similar in their makeup. The main difference, though, that you can utilize, like the, this knowledge of the difference between these two and how you can utilize it, is that tendons um, come out of that musculature, right, and then attach to a bony junction. And your ability to affect or impact your tendon health by what's happening in the musculature and the fascia within the musculature is, is huge. Like you have a lot of control there. Your ability to impact your ligaments is a little less uh, direct because of where they live. Uh, so nevertheless, you can impact them for sure. So what I really want you to understand here though is the fascial health of whatever, let's say like your calves where it meets the Achilles tendon, because I gave that as an example. Um, the fascial health of your calf fascia, as it moves from your calves into that Achilles tendon, will directly impact the health of your Achilles tendon because your Achilles tendon is made of the fascia that comes out of that musculature. So the healthier your calf fascia, the healthier that Achilles tendon. And you could go upstream and say too that the health of your hamstring fascia, for example, is gonna directly impact the health of your Achilles tendon as well, just a little less, a little less than your calf fascia. So typically with tendons and ligaments, the fascia within the musculature directly surrounding um, that attachment site and maybe whatever joint is nearby is gonna have the most direct impact on that tendon or ligament. However, everything is connected and we are a mechanism of miraculous compensation. Uh, so a compensation pattern could be occurring 
that is causing that calf fascia to tighten up and tighten up. And no matter how much fascia release you do, it may continue to tighten due to say pelvic instability where your feet are gripping the ground and your fascia is tightening up in your calf. And thus your Achilles tendon happens to be like in the middle of this tug of war um, or compensation pattern. So not meant to be the purpose of this video is to, to, you know, follow this thread of like finding the root cause of Achilles tendonitis or other pains. I just want you to know um, that it is all connected. So when I say that uh, whatever fascia within the musculature around a tendon or a ligament is going to have the most direct impact, what I'm talking about here is blood flow. Uh, the nutrients within the extracellular matrix portion of that fascia. Uh, those two things primarily, and then the water content there is going to directly impact whether that tendon or ligament can heal quickly when injured, um, or even just repair itself from being utilized a lot, right? So if you are a runner or a hiker or someone who uses, you know, your calves, your lower body, your Achilles tendon a lot, um, you want to make sure that the fascia around that whole area is really healthy with a lot of blood flow, a lot of water content and, um, good nutrition in the ECM, right? And a healthy ECM that your cells have ac access to because your body's going to use those nutrients to heal, um, and repair micro tears in the tendons and ligaments that begin to occur before a major injury happens. So you can definitely prevent tendon and ligament injuries with fascia release, and you can definitely heal them with fascia release because by releasing fascia, you're going to increase blood flow. You're going to, um, move out stagnant waste right? Whatever is not serving your body that needs to get moved out. Maybe there's even something in the lymph system. So you're going to move that out. Um, then you're going to bring in fresh blood and fresh water. Uh, and you're going to allow that ECM to be like a stocked refrigerator that has every, you know, nutrient that you're going to need for the next five, six months, something like that. You know, I'm just throwing numbers out there. Um, so you don't have to worry about going to the store anymore, right? Um, that's what opening up your fascial system can do. And of course you have to maintain it. Um, fascia release, like anything else has to be part of a maintenance program for yourself. If you want to maintain the benefits, like anything, you can't just go on a diet once, you know, for a week, eat healthy for a week and be good for life. And it's the same with fascia release. Um, but something that I want to just mention here with tendons and ligaments is in the case of say tendinosis, um, the medical definition of tendinosis is a chronic condition in which the tendon has lost its collagen. So that's really interesting to me, a chronic condition in which there's a, you know, a degrading of collagen content, like a continual decrease of the amount of collagen in the tendon. Um, tendonitis tends to be more just inflammation of the tendon. Um, so both those things I think are pretty interesting to think about. And then ligaments, of course, are a little more mysterious, um, but we can definitely open up the fascial system around a ligament, get blood flow to it, just like we can a tendon. So it's my theory that tendons can respond really quick to you fascia release if you're injured. So I have helped people, for example, with, um, sprained ankles or Achilles tendonitis, elbow tendonitis. Uh, I don't know that I've actually gotten anyone with a doctor's diagnosis of tendinosis per se. It's usually itis. I don't know why, but they seem to diagnose itises more than the tendinosis. Um, but they go away so fast in my session. Like sometimes one session is all it takes. Um, sometimes two or three but pretty quickly compared to how it came on. And the fact is we're actually cr creating endemic collagen and hyaluronic acid, you know, that water is coming in and we're increasing the body's ability to produce its own collagen and get it to that tendon or ligament. So, um, that's really it for that. Um, I would love, if this fact really applies to you right now, I would love for you to share a takeaway from that below. Um, and how you're going to use this information to maybe heal an injury like a tendinosis, tendinitis, or ligament tear diagnosis. Um, and then we're moving on. All right, moving on to number two, all about those interoceptors and interoception. I believe there are huge implications here, not just for each of us physiologically, but also maybe psycho spiritually and 
I want to dive into that with you, those two things. So I mentioned before that interoception is your sensory experience of what's happening internally and your ability to assess what's happening and then um, determine maybe an action that should be happening. And most of the time, this is happening below the conscious awareness, b below your conscious awareness. Um, and if you can make it conscious, you can start to have much more direct conscious control over your quality of life, over maybe even the ability to self-diagnose when something feels off or wrong, and then actually self-correct. And perhaps, I'm theorizing here, but perhaps prevent illness and disease or injury. So it's it could be as simple as, you know, I notice that I'm hungry and tuning in and really trying to ascertain what your body is longing for from a nourishment perspective. Maybe you're tuning into a deficiency in minerals or vitamins or hormones or something like that. And your instincts and uh, maybe even cravings to an extent can actually guide you to proper things that will help your body. Uh, of course, this is really subtle and we can never know for sure. Uh, but it is something I love to experiment with. I'll give you an example of this. When I was experiencing a lot of the symptoms of mercury poisoning before I knew that it was mercury, so I was aware something was off and I was having some symptoms, but I wasn't like in full alarm mode yet. I got the most intense craving for salmon that I have ever had in my life. And like, I rarely eat fish. I, and when I do, it's always salmon and it's only sustainable caught Alaskan salmon. Uh, and it's just pretty rare that I will like binge on it. I'll have it every once in a while, but I got the most intense craving for it. I mean, like I thought I might kill somebody like this is so interesting. So I went and bought some at the store and made some dishes for Stefan and I that were salmon based. And I felt like if he didn't leave me enough or if I didn't get my fill, I might like kill him for the rest of it. Like it was a rabid craving. And of course, like I wouldn't actually kill him, but I was tuning into something in me that had this rabid craving for this food. And I wanted to listen to it. And instead of just being like, well, that's weird, you know, I guess I'll eat some salmon and move on with my life. I actually was like, huh, this is fascinating. What might this mean? And I took to Google and I started looking up um, health benefits of Alaskan salmon. And a few things really stood out to me, but the number one one uh, was, and I believe actually Stefan caught this, is salmon has a lot of selenium and selenium helps protect the brain against neurotoxins. And I probably ate salmon four or five times that week and a lot of it. And I finally was like, okay, I'm good. And we didn't have salmon again for a long time. Um, but that was actually a clue that I was gathering in my, you know, kind of all the puzzle pieces that I was putting in front of me to figure out what was going on with me. And that was actually one of the puzzle pieces I put in there is, insane craving for salmon. Salmon has selenium, protects against neurotoxins. This was what helped me intuitively know that I was being poisoned a month or two later. And I went and tested for mercury because it's one of the most common neurotoxins that produces the symptoms I was having. So this is just one example of how you can use interoception in a conscious way uh, at a really physiological level. Um, but now I wanna turn towards the other way, which is more that psycho-spiritual. And what I mean by that is your sense of self, your self-awareness, your relationship to yourself, um, and then everything that that relationship impacts, which includes your physical self, right? So it includes physiology, um, injury, illness, disease, as well as your other relationships and your relationship to the world. Um, so of course, like interoception, proprioception, nociception, all these things impact each other and inform each other. You're not gathering data about your internal self to keep it contained here. You're gathering it to know how to orient yourself so that you can also properly execute external behaviors, right? So it's all related. Um, but 
I, I believe to a large degree, our sense of self and our relationship to ourself impacts everything to do with interoception. And interoceptors is kind of an umbrella name for the uh, sensory receptors that are responsible for gathering data about your internal environment. And it includes chemoreceptors and nociceptors um, as part of a nosis or uh, as part of an interoception process, um, meaning you can start to decipher if something's wrong or painful or there's a danger internally. Remember that nociception isn't necessarily a pain receptor. It's the uh, sensory receptor that um, recognizes a potential danger is happening and gets your attention with a pain signal. Um, and it's your job to actually tune in and figure out if that danger signal is legitimate or a, you know, a false alarm. Um, so interoception, there's a lot going on with interoception. I think it's the more complicated um, sensory you know, receptor uh, when compared to say proprioception is a bit more self-explanatory. Um, exteroception is pretty self-explanatory as well. And then nociception is kind of like its own thing, right? But interoception kind of includes a lot of the others. Chemoreceptors are, you know, uh, your sensory receptors responding to your chemical makeup and environment and, uh, you know, assessing what's going on there so that it can regulate. So this regulation is actually a huge part of interoception. Um, and mostly up until I, you know, like the last, I don't even know, I think I would even say up until now, um, these processes have been mostly unconscious. So your ability to self-regulate temperature, nervous system um, processes like fight, flight, freeze, etc., cetera, um, or rest and digest or parasympathetic, um, your ability to regulate mood, your ability to regulate digestion and all these things historically have happened at the unconscious level. And now in this modern world, we are, I believe, being asked to make them conscious and to actually take some conscious um, control uh, uh, over those processes and engage your consciousness with your physiology in a new way. Um, and that psycho-spiritual aspect, again, I'm going to come back to that, has more to do with, again, that sense of self. So what I would like to ask you right now, or have you ask yourself, is what is your sense of self like? What is your relationship like to yourself and to your body? Do you love your body? Do you hate your body? Um, do you wish it wasn't the way it was? You know, do you wish your body was not behaving in ways that it's currently behaving? Do you love yourself or do you, you know, are there issues of feeling not worthy? Is there a lot of shame, um, right? Any of those internal processes are part of, I believe, interoception and will drastically impact whether you believe that inhabiting your body is a is a good experience or a bad experience. And I wouldn't label any of it good or bad. I just mean, is it, is it a positive experience for you? Do you love being in a relationship with your body even when it gives you pain? Because you get to then consciously tune in and figure out how to work with your body to achieve optimal health. Or do you, are you in a battle with your body? Or are you in a battle with yourself? I have a firm belief that we can't heal a body we hate. So if you are in a battle with your body for any reason, it's going to be really difficult to form a partnership between you and your body that is geared towards healing. Uh, and of course, like I could go on and on and on about this interoception process. I hope you're, you're kind of getting what I'm talking about here from the psycho spiritual perspective. It's just, it's your psyche and your, your soul and spirit, whatever language you want to use and that relationship you have to yourself. Um, so I believe that relationship is going to directly impact the physiology, like I said, and all these other processes as well, including exteroception, which is your relationship to the external world, external world. So if you already have an internal orientation that inhabiting your body isn't safe, then it's going to be pretty difficult for you to um, interface with the external world from a, from a trusting place. 
And um, and what I mean by that, even at a really basic level, is if you can't tune in and trust yourself and trust what you are intuiting and instinctively feeling and observing internally, you aren't going to properly be able to assess what's happening in the external world because that's actually an internal process of deciphering and making meaning out of what you, the data you're gathering about the external world. So your level of internal trust and the degree to which you're able to trust yourself and all of the data that you're gathering internally is going to definitely get mirrored externally. And I'll give you an example. I don't know if you're familiar with Alex Honnold, but he's a rock climber and he does amazing things. Um, He free soloed El Capitan, which is crazy. Um, And I was listening to an interview with Alex uh, and Michael Gervais, who's a um, sports psychologist, and they were kind of talking about, and Michael was theorizing that it it was Alex's level of self-trust and his ability to tune in and really be with himself and really trust his internal environment that allowed him to externalize that and accurately perceive the rock and where he needed to place his foot and to be able to solve that problem Uh, and actually succeed at climbing this crazy wall without ropes. So um, just kind of an extreme sport example there, but I think it has implications for all of us. So it's all related um, and I believe it'll impact your relationships, your career, your athletic ability, so many things. So I would really love to hear from you on this one. What does interoception mean to you right now? Is it a brand new concept to you just from this video? Um, And how are you currently orienting to yourself, to your body, and then to you as a being, as a conscious being? Um, How are you orienting to yourself and how do you think that's impacting how you're inhabiting your body? That's what I'd love to hear from you if you'd be willing to share. And finally, um, fact number three, our last fact in the Fast Fascia Fact series, um, all about this water content of our fascia. And uh, the thing that I really want to focus on here, well, two things primarily, is uh, we want to be optimally 70% water, I think, you know, in our whole body and fascially. That... Uh, ratio is mirrored in our fascia. So you'll hear people say we're, you know, we're 70% water or we're 60% water. Really, we're anywhere from 55 to 70% water, typically, um, at, you know, just like a whole body level, your whole body water content. And your fascia is supposed to be up to 70% water as well. And it really is the loss of this water in your fascial system that causes you to age faster or age, you know, as you age, which is a normal process for all of us, we lose that water content and we get stiff, we get achy, uh, you know, our joints don't move as well. Uh, We have difficulty performing tasks that used to be easy for us. And I think a lot of this, not all of it, but a lot of it has to do with this water content. Um, But the thing that I really want to focus here on this last episode of Fast Fascia Facts are two things primarily. One, it is this high water content that creates your shock absorption system within your body and allows your fascial system to distribute any mechanical stress coming in throughout the whole system so that no one specific place takes the hit and becomes injured. It is this high water content that will prevent you from getting injury. It's an injury prevention Uh, experience to be 70% water. It is when you start to lose that water content that you become more prone to injuries like tendon and ligament tears. Um, Of course, there's other elements here like collagen and hyaluronic acid and, and those types of things and the other nutrients that we need and blood flow. That's also very important. But the fact that we're supposed to be 70% water and that our fascia is supposed to be 70% water is, you know, it's like, that's a big number. Like that's, it's way more water than anything else that we are, including 
what people are calling, you know, um, dark matter or <laughs> the space in our body, right? Like where it's like negative space and we're actually more that than anything else. So the fact that there's that and then what is here physically is supposed to be 70% water, I think is huge. So we should um, probably focus on this high water content if we want to be optimally healthy. Um, and of course, I've talked about this ad nauseum throughout <laughs> these fast fashion facts, how to create the high water content. And I'll just cover it one more time here. Um, it's really about that compression and sharing of fascial fibers to activate hyaluronic acid, which imbibes the water that you drink. Um, and then it's about drinking high quality water as well. Uh, and I'll cover that in probably future videos in numerous ways, because I think it's an important topic to come back to. Um, but the other aspect that I wanted to talk about here is a little more mystical. <laughs> um, and, and that is that water has some really interesting spiritual properties or what you might call metaphysical properties, um, quantum physics properties. Uh, water, I believe, is partly what conducts our consciousness and allows us to have um, thoughts that move at the speed of light or the speed of sound. Um, this isn't my area of extreme expertise when it comes to the science here. <laughs> I feel a lot and intuit a lot here and I want to learn more about the science. So uh, definitely bear with me on that. Like I don't know what's faster, the, the sound of light or the sound of um, the speed of light or the speed of sound, but um, the purpose of, or the point of, of me talking about this is, I believe it's that high water content in us that allows thoughts, feelings, sensations, basically data, communications, to happen rapidly without interference. And the more water content you lose, the less conscious you become to an extent, the less able you are to to utilize your consciousness, if you wanna look at it that way. And the more interference and blockages appear in the system that might need to be unblocked or looked at to, again, optimize. Um, I think it's interesting that we come into this world as babies that were made up of 93% water when we're born. And we don't have that like I consciousness, ego consciousness yet, we're just, we're beings, we are beings of feeling and sensation and instincts. And, you know, we just, we just are, <laughs> we just do what, you know, when we're babies, um, there's no self consciousness yet. There's no, um, self awareness even per se. There's just a lot of instincts, intuitions and being, um, I believe it is part of why we're here on earth right now to, in a sense, lose that um, as we grow up, as we become children and then young adults and then adults, we lose access to that um, state of beingness uh, and we become thinking beings. And I think this is totally appropriate. And I believe we are being asked to use our thinking and our consciousness as adult human beings to actually evolve and grow and hold each other accountable to a higher standard of what it means to be a human being on this planet. And, and then on an individual level, through a conscious effort of your own, regain your ability to be in, in, you know, be with sensation, be with feeling, be with instincts and intuitions, and then out of your conscious self, direct, begin to direct your life and your relationships and your sense of self and um, your sense of the world and all of your activities therein. So I know that's like a little woo woo and metaphysical, but this is the stuff that I love nerding out on and thinking about and pondering. And so I kind of wanted to leave you um, at this last flash of facts with something a little more in that direction, because it's something I want to talk about more and more. And like I said, I believe there are physiological, uh, benefits and implications too for that high water content, right? But I'm super curious to hear what you think about this. If you've ever studied or learned about the properties of water that I'm talking about, um, they're out there. You can find them on YouTube. There've been studies done on, of course, like, you know, beaming certain thoughts and feelings at water. And apparently, you know, they can measure 
uh, I guess the, I don't know if it's like the molecular structure of the water changes, something like that, um, based on what a human being thinks or feels towards it. Um, very, very fascinating. And so if you think about that, even from an interoception perspective, if you are thinking thoughts of, of self-loathing and then feeling shame and feeling, you know, anything on that level, which I'm not um, maligning here, I think that all of these experiences we have are valid and a part of our process of evolution. Um, and it's going to impact your, your body. So this could be one way your body is actually getting your attention about a psycho-spiritual issue. Um, and it's this high water content that's going to help you um, move those thoughts through your body and actually assess everything with rapid efficiency instead of things kind of being stuck and knotted up and er intertwined and enmeshed. So. There we go. That was a big one, I know. Um, but yeah, please share your thoughts below. I can't wait to read them on this one. I can't wait to talk to you. Thank you so much for watching this whole series called Fast Fascia Facts. Um, it's been a lot of fun for me to share this with you. I hope you've gotten something out of it. And I will see you in the comments below and then see you next week.